Yeah. 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 Dim the lights. It's still not done. It's still not done. Uh, I, I wrote it on the board. I had, hadn't mentioned it yet. Now, we've been talking about the economy. We've been talking about the Federal Reserve. We just finished talking about inflation and why inflation is bad. Because you're putting money into circulation. You basically have no substance behind it. There, there's nothing to back up the money. Now, if you inflate, if you add money, you know, and inflate the economy, the money that's in circulation becomes worth less. And if you add enough money, the money that's in circulation becomes worthless. So inflation is bad. Now, Alan Greenspan tells us that we need the economy to be inflated about 5%. Now, wait a minute. Why would that be true? If inflation is bad, why would 5% inflation be good? Well, if you woke up tomorrow morning and everything cost you twice as much, wouldn't you be a little bit concerned? I mean, wouldn't you, like, you know, call your congressman and say, wait a minute, how did you guys do that to us? <coughs> well, if they inflate the economy five cents a year, you know, and so bread starts out as a dollar a loaf, and then in December, now it's a dollar five. Are you going to write your congressman and say, wait a minute, bread went up a nickel? No, probably not. You know, it's, it's you know, not wor enough to, to worry about. Well, then the next year it's up to dollar ten, and then dollar, you know, sixteen, and, you know, so on. Inflation is bad. The reason that they inflated at five percent is because it's not so bad that we're going to notice or complain. How many people know the story about how to cook a frog? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright? Well, basically that's what they're doing. They're doing it in little increments so that we don't get irritated. Well, let's get irritated anyway. Now, inflation is bad. Let's talk about deflation. October 1929, stock market crash. Oh, terrible, terrible stuff. Accident, right? No, the stock market crash was deliberately caused. You know, you can read books on that. They deliberately caused the crash of the stock market. Now, if that was the only thing that happened, the stock market would have, you know, been recovered in about, you know, three months. Okay, no problem. Is the stock market crash caused the Great Depression? No. What caused the Great Depression? Anybody have any idea? They took the money out of circulation. They took the money out of circulation. They contracted the money supply. In October, the day that the stock market crashed, the amount of money in circulation was enough so that each man, woman, and child could have $2,400. So if you spread it all out, everybody would have $2,400. A year later, guess how much money was in circulation? $14.50 per person. From 2,400 to 14? If you're paddling down the river in a canoe and somebody sucks all the water out of the river, where are you going to go? You're going to be sitting there going, what happened? Now, the Great Depression, was that because you didn't have enough people to work? Were people sitting around going, you know, I'm just not going to work today? No, you had people begging for jobs. Please hire me. Why can't they hire you? Because we got nothing to pay you with. I want to buy that apple. Okay, give me a dollar. I don't have a dollar to give you. Money is just supposed to change hands. There wasn't enough money so we could do our business. And the economy came to a grinding halt on purpose. So now we say, oh my gosh, a terrible, terrible trouble. We've got this national emergency. Whatever will we do? Oh gosh, I know. Let's elect Frank Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a socialist. And he's going to pass all these New Deal programs. Did the New Deal programs eliminate 
the the depression? No. How did they cause it? Taking money out. How did they end it? By printing money. Oh, son of a gun, everything is better. Thank you, FDR. How stupid can we be? It's like, you know, watch the little birdie over here and with the other hand they're, you know, slicing our throat. So the Federal Reserve Bank is supposed to be, you know, working in our favor? No. Is the Federal Reserve Bank part of the government? No. People say, well, it's got federal in it. It's got to be part of the government. Is Federal Express part of the post office? No. Just because it's got the word federal? Anybody ever order federal pizza? It's like, oh my gosh, this must have the government stamp of approval. How come there's no pepperoni? You know, just because it's got the word federal in it doesn't mean anything. And you can prove it to yourself. Go to the phone book. Go to the blue pages where all the government offices are. You know, post office, you know, police departments and stuff. Show me Federal Reserve Bank. It's not there. Flip back to the white pages, find Federal Express, and you may be lucky enough to find it just, you know, a couple inches away from there. It's a private corporation. It has never been audited. Now, why was Abraham Lincoln assassinated? Greenback. Yeah, <laughs> Stood in front of the bullet. Now, Abraham Lincoln was fighting the Civil War, and he wanted money. You think bankers are willing to loan him money? You bet. You want that money? Sure thing, Abe. It's going to cost you 30%. Abe said, no, 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 no. I've got enough problems on my hand with the war. I'm not going to make more by, you know, borrowing your money at 30%. So Abraham Lincoln printed new money. He, well, he went back to Washington. He says, what am I ever going to do? And his treasurer says, print money. Fifth, you know, the, for Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. Coin money and regulate the value thereof. That's one of the things the government can do. So Abraham Lincoln printed money with green ink on the back. Up until then, money was black and white. Why did he put it on green ink? So he'd be able to tell which ones were which. So he printed a couple million dollars, put it in circulation, won the Civil War, and then started taking all those monies out. Anything with a green back was taken out of circulation. So for a short period of time we had inflation, but at least we didn't pay interest on it. And he pissed off the bankers because he wouldn't play their game. Bang! Everybody wants to know, whatever happened to JFK certainly was not Oswald. No. I mean, who can believe... I mean, you can't even get three bullets out of the gun that fast, much less aim. Anybody who's used a bolt-action rifle knows that. Now, on... Uh, Page 26, I've got a, uh, a short commentary on just perhaps why JFK might have been killed. JFK uh, decided to eliminate the power of the Federal Reserve Bank to strip its m power to loan money and start printing federal uh, uh, treasury notes. Start printing it by the government the way they're supposed to do. And that was with Executive Order 11-110. And I've got Executive Order 11110 listed right there. And it says, by virtue of the authority vested in me, um, by the present paragraph such and such of May 12, 1933, okay, to issue silver certificates against any silver bullion, silver, or standard silver dollars in the treasury, not then held for redemption. So JFK was going to give us our money back. Five months later, somebody put a bullet in his head. Twizzlers.
Just a pure coincidence, I'm sure. Okay? That law, that executive order has never been repealed. We can still do that. We can still have the Treasury print silver certificates. Why don't they? You know, no, nobody wants to stand in front of that bullet anymore. Do they have the silver to back um, yeah, there's quite a bit of silver. Silver is actually better for us right now than gold because there is so much of it. There's too much of it. I mean, we had people that tried to corner the market on it, and they couldn't do it. There's just too much. You know? So, um, then on page 27, I have a series of quotes that are all dealing with the Federal Reserve. Um, says, 100% of what is collected is absorbed solely by interest on the federal debt. All individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on services taxpayers expect from the government. This was the Grace Commission that was uh, authorized by uh, Reagan. They did a study. They said, your tax money does not go for hospitals and roads and national defense. Not a single penny. It's a lie. How many people have ever heard of the Grace Commission? Well, they've kind of swept it under the rug. I'm still trying to get a copy of it. Uh, Daniel Webster said, Of all contrivances for cheating the laboring classes of mankind, none has been more effective than that which deludes them with paper money. Um... Thomas Jefferson said, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation and then deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children will wake up homeless on the continents their father conquered. You're going to end up with spit. I'll let you go through uh, those other quotes. Here's the President Andrew Jackson. You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out. And by the grace of eternal God, I will rout you out. And he did the best job of uh, getting rid of the uh, uh, thing. Page 28 has other uh, quotes. In the middle, Representative Lewis McFadden said... The Federal Reserve Banks are the most corrupt institutions the world has ever seen. There is not a man within the sound of my voice who does not know that this nation is run by the international bankers. And he was speaking in Congress. Congress knows exactly what's going on. Congress is not working out for your best interests. Now, how did all this happen? In 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was uh, written, and the Federal Reserve started printing money. They were loaning money to the United States. We were obligated to pay our debts, our interest, in gold. We'll give you this paper. You have to pay us in gold. That happened for 33 or for 20 years. In 1933. The United States went bankrupt. Now, I've met somebody who actually heard Franklin Delano Roosevelt say that live. This is not some history book. This is a person who heard it for himself. And in June, on June 5th of 1933, FDR, our favorite guy, passed a joint resolution to suspend the gold standard. So Congress presumably passed a law that says you are not allowed to demand gold or silver. Up until then, you can say, I'll give you anything you want, but you've got to pay me in gold. <coughs> and FDR says, no, you can't do that. It's now illegal to demand gold. Says who? How can they make it illegal to demand gold? Do you have an unlimited right to contract? Yes. So how can FDR tell you what you can or cannot accept? But, whereas the existing emergency, which existing emergency are they talking about? The bankruptcy. 
the bankruptcy, the depression. Oh my gosh, the economy is terrible. Oh yeah, but you created that artificially. The existing emergency has disclosed the provisions of obligations which purport to give the obligee a right to require payment in gold or a particular kind of coin or currency or in the amount of coin in the U.S. Uh, measured thereby obstruct the power of Congress to regulate the value of money. So your rights are kind of a pain in the butt for us, so we're going to eliminate your rights. They can't do that. They didn't give them to us. They can't take them away. And this act is completely and totally unconstitutional. And down below, they say the term coin or currency means coin or currency of the United States, including Federal Reserve notes. So suddenly, worthless paper is now going to be traded the same as gold and silver. Isn't that wonderful? Page 30, in 1933, this is 1933, this is as it was happening. There were people awake, but nobody was listening. Congressman Beck, speaking from the congressional record, what does that mean? On the floor. It means on the floor, on the congressional record means that you can go to the archives and look it up. Don't take my word for it, go <coughs> read the man's words yourself. Is I think of all the damnable heresies that have ever been suggested in connection with the Constitution, the doctrine of emergency is the worst. It means that when Congress declares an emergency, there is no Constitution. It means it's death. It's the very doctrine that the German Chancellor is invoking today. Which German Chancellor? Hitler. Hitler. So FDR did exactly the same thing that Hitler did. We bombed Hitler. We call him the worst, most evil man in history. But we're going to build a monument to FDR? Where's the logic in that? I have promised myself that before I die, I am going to go to Hyde Park, New York, and I am going to piss on his grave. <laughs> Zoom in on that, would you? <laughs> it says Chancellor Hitler is at least frank about it. We pay the Constitution lip service, but the result <laughs> is the same. And so since March 9th of 1933, the United States has been, in fact, in a state of declared national emergency. My mother was born in 1934. She has lived her entire life under a state of national emergency. Well, if we're in a state of national emergency, how can we go out to these Fourth of July picnics and throw the Frisbee and have hot dogs? It's an emergency. Shouldn't we be running around going, the sky is falling, the sky is falling? How could it be a national emergency? An emergency means temporary. You know, it's on fire, you put the fire out, the emergency's over with. How can an emergency last for 70 years? Just by definition, it's no longer an emergency. Now, the president may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation and communication, regulate the operation of private enterprise, restrict travel, and in a plethora of particular ways, control the lives of American citizens. Don't you feel special? And they have been renewing that uh, emergency. Yeah. I guess in 1970 sometime they said, wait a minute, you can't have an emergency that lasts that long. The president has to reallocate that emergency every two years. Yeah. And they do. Start writing Freedom of Information Acts and asking about all that. We need a president that's willing to say, the national emergency is over. Now... You didn't mention about the confiscation of gold <coughs> uh, by executive order also. Right. Uh, and that, that's true. Uh, I'm trying to kind of... 
what, what he's asking about is the confiscation of gold. Basically, Roosevelt tried to make own, or claimed to make owning gold illegal. Right. It's now illegal because you're hoarding it. You are an enemy of the state. You've got to turn in all your gold. And people did. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's the funny part. It's like, why? You know, you've got to jump off that cliff. No, I don't think I do. And what did they do? They put all of our gold in Fort Knox to keep it safe. <laughs> Has anybody seen that gold? We've tried to get audits. Can you get anywhere close to Fort Knox? No, the gold's not there. All we want to do is we want to go in with a video camera. Just we want just want to see our gold. They don't let you in because it ain't there. They've lied to us again. How bad does it have to get before we do something? Page 31. I'm just going to go through these real briefly. We've got so much corruption in the United States, it's not even funny. World War I was deliberately started. I mean, everybody was all, you know, happy. They were shaking hands and somebody assassinated Archduke Ferdinand. Oops, there we go. Got everything in. Uh, U.S. was deliberately dragged in by sinking the Lusitania. World War II was deliberately started. And FDR got us into the world, uh, world War II. How did he do that? Blockade the uh, Japanese. Uh, well, he was, he was, he was uh, blockading Japan, yeah. but he also created the Pearl Harbor travesty. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make each of you admiral. You have a navy. One of the good things about a navy is that you've got lots of boats, and boats can move around and zigzag. A moving target is hard to hit. Anybody disagree with that? Not only is your boat hard to hit because it's moving, it's hard to find. Mm -hmm. You can hide it in the ocean. Anybody fly across the ocean? I mean, you know, if you have a boat out there, the boat's probably the only place that... The only people who know where it is. Finding a needle in a haystack is easy compared to finding a boat in the ocean. So now, as the admiral, your first act is to decide whether this is a good idea or not. We're going to take all of our boats and we're going to put them in this little tiny harbor called Pearl Harbor and we're going to line them up in a straight line. How many admirals in the room want to do that? <laughs> not one. Why did we have our boats there in the first place? Because before he became president, FDR was also Secretary of the Navy. When he got elected president, he gave his admiral the order. He says, put all of your boats in Pearl Harbor. The admiral says, I will not. I'm an admiral. I mean, what kind of admiral am I going to be if I put all my boats in Pearl Harbor? No. FDR fired him. Put somebody else in. Said, put all your boats in the harbor. And he said, well, gosh, look what happened to my predecessor. You know, I don't want to lose all these shiny medals. FDR deliberately caused Pearl Harbor to get us involved in World War II. That is treason. If he were alive today, I would assassinate that SOB myself. Anybody want to know my real feelings on the issue? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, we got it on the table. <laughs> now, the question now becomes, if things are so bad, is there any good news? Is, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? And the answer is yes. Don't give up. We are just about to turn this thing around. If you don't do anything, we're definitely going down the tubes. So if we are going to turn it around, we've got to get up off of our fannies and do something. Now, one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to regain our law. The third article of the Constitution is the smallest and it provides us with the least amount of protection. That's where we need to focus. So, join the Fully Informed Jury Association. 
One of the things that juries can do is they can overturn the law. It's called jury nullification. Now, judges will lie to you. They say, you get to decide the facts, I will decide the law. Uh-uh. Not the way it really happens. So if I get arrested for having black hair, according to their rules, you get to say, well, does Mike have black hair? Well, yeah, it looks like it. Guilty! You go, well, yeah, but wait a minute. The way things really work is you go, yes, he does have black hair, and we really don't care if the law says it. It's a stupid law. We're going to override that. We refuse to find him guilty. That's what happened. That's where juries came from. When they were trying to accuse William Penn of heresy because he wasn't teaching the proper religion. The jurors were put in jail. They were starved and beaten. And they refused to find him guilty. The judge finally had to let him go. So that's one of the places that I would focus. Now, instant runoff voting. One of the things that we can do as we're working for is to get this you know, check mark. When I say, I want you to vote for the Libertarian, people say, well, I don't want to waste my vote. If I vote for the Libertarian, you know, the bad guy is going to win, and I'm going to feel really terrible. Because I didn't vote to you know, prevent the bad guy from winning. Now, I don't care which guy you think is the bad guy, you're not wasting your vote. If you have, if I give you a choice, a 45% chance at lethal injection, a 50% chance of the electric chair, and 5% for escape. What are you going to vote for? The electric chair because you're likely to win? What are you going to vote for? Escape. But it's only 5%. I don't care. It's the right thing to do. Now, with instant runoff voting, you get to itemize. This is my first choice. This is my second choice. This is my third choice. Now, you can vote for the guy you really want to vote for. And if he doesn't win, you know, they will take your second choice and go for the guy so that, you know, the bad one doesn't win. And now, when we start getting 20, 25, and 30 percent for the libertarians, guess what? Things are going to change. Um, I have a copy of uh, Pretty Good Privacy. It's called PGP, and it's a software program that lets you scramble your email. You can scramble it up so that the CIA and the FBI cannot read it. Grandma's peanut butter cookie recipe is safe. Now, I won't go into too much detail, but we are now using 2,096 bits of encryption. It would take a Cray computer just about a hundred years to number crunch all the possibilities. By that time, Grandma's going to be dead, I'm going to be dead, and we really don't care about the peanut butter cookie recipe. The reason the FBI and CIA are upset is because they can't break the code. So if you have email, Get a copy of PGP. Now, Mike, I was yes. pushing the tape. What, what were they upset about? Oh, was that? Again? Wire oh, the, F the FBI? Yeah. The FBI and the CIA are upset because PGP works. You can scramble your email messages so well that they can't read it. And it just pisses them off. Well, why should they read it anyway? I thought I had a right to privacy. If you thought, do you write your love letters in the back of a postcard? <laughs> no, not generally, because it's not for public consumption. You know, it's only for honey bun. So you put it in an envelope so nobody else can read it. Well, if you're sending email, every computer that that email stops on can make a copy of it. Anything that you print in an email which is not encrypted, you better be ready for that to show up on the front page of the New York Times. 
So buy a copy of PGP. You can get a copy for free off the internet. They can give you test copies. It works really well, and I highly recommend it. Uh, What's the website on that? PGP.com. And the other person has to have it to be I, I can go into more detail about how it works. I mean, I'm a computer guy. Uh, how it works is irrelevant. The fact that it does work is what you really need to be concerned with. Um, now, there is a project TOTO to expose and end the illegal operation of the income tax system. In a couple of weeks, we are going to go to Washington and we are going to be dragging the IRS over hot coals, asking them difficult questions. Now, the government never gives us anything that they still want. If they have agreed to go to Washington and answer our questions, I am convinced the IRS is out. They don't care anymore. They don't want the IRS, and they're going to say, okay, you guys win. Except that they've got something better in the background, which I think is national sales tax. So we've got to be careful that we don't let them slip in something worse than the IRS. Um, NORFED. We've already talked about NORFED. We can take back our currency. The economy is what's all screwed up. Silver doesn't inflate. This is real value. They can't stop you from using that. All you have to do to take back some of your liberty is use liberty currency instead. Where can you use it? All of your friends. If you and I exchange something, let's use liberty currency instead. Digital money is going to be the solution to all this. The reason that the Federal Reserve has all the power is because we are forced to use their money. Very, very soon, we won't have to. How many people here would have a Swiss bank account if they could? Okay. Why would you want a Swiss bank account? For privacy? The fact that you are the only person in the world who knows how much money you've got in the bank? Well, that's not true with a Swiss bank account. There are two people, you and the Swiss banker. You now have an opportunity to do something better than a Swiss bank account. And it is called 3pgold.com. The three P's are privacy, protection, and profit. If I told you you could go out to the internet and get yourself a Swiss bank account, it's better than a Swiss bank account. A, because you don't have to travel to Switzerland. B, a Swiss bank account, I think you have to have like $25,000 minimum. This only requires a $1,000 minimum. And three, this, there's only one person in the world who knows that you've got the account. You. The computer knows, but the computer's not telling. Now, how does this work? You want to sell me a book. You tell your account, I'm about to get money. You know, Somebody's about to give me $100. The computer will send you one of these encryption scrambles. You look at it, it just looks like nonsense. And you give that to me. Well, I, I can't read it, but I give it to my account and I say, I want to send $100 to this scramble, whatever that is. So the money disappears from my account and shows up in yours. I have no idea where it went. And then you send me the book. Now, if I'm calling myself George, you don't know who you sold the book to. All you care about is that you did sell the book. Now, how many people in the world know that a transaction took place? Two, me and you, and I ain't telling. Right now, 3P Gold is like trying to sell somebody the very first fax machine. Imagine being a salesman. I've got this really great machine, and you put the paper in here, and it dials the phone, and it comes out someplace else. You go, great, who can I send it to? 
Well, nobody. <laughs> I mean, you're the only one. It's like, well, then why would I buy one? Well, where, where did they first go show up? Well, somebody like Ford Motor Company said, well, we'll buy two of them. You know, that way, you know, the secretary doesn't have to run back and forth. You know, we can, it'll just save time. Well, then General Motors buys a couple. You go, oh, wow, so we can fax something to General Motors, too? And then pretty soon somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Now, fax machines are ubiquitous. I mean, people have them in their study. I've had people say, I don't want your email address or your phone number. I want your fax number. Fax machines are all over the place. You can fax something to anybody, practically. Now, how many people had email 10 years ago? Me and Jim and maybe two of my geek buddies. <laughs> email? What's that? Now, who has email? Everybody. Everybody has email. 12 year old kids have their own email. My mother has email. Even the homeless and you know? the public library. The, you know, everybody's got email. In 10 years, email is everywhere. Why? So we can send stupid jokes to each other. Isn't that great? It's like, oh yeah, grandma's peanut butter cookie recipe. So in 10 years, we have everybody's got email for something stupid like jokes. Now, if I told you that you could get this 3P gold account now and you know like and you could you do these secret accounts you can buy somebody for in for something in Russia and it's a secret any money that you take out of the bank and put in 3P gold can the IRS get to it get to what I don't know what you're talking about account no I don't know anything about an account is that guaranteed? What's that? Is it guaranteed? As long as you don't forget your password. <laughs> they tell you right up front, do not forget your password. Don't call us, because we can't figure it out. It's all encrypted. Could you have like your paycheck direct deposited or something like that? Eventually, not yet. Does it draw interest? Um, that's the three P gold. Protection, privacy, and profit. And they and they haven't got it completely up to speed yet, but what they're going to allow you to do is do investments, just like the stock market. And when you, the stock market here in the United States is controlled by the SEC. If you do trading on the world market, you don't have that limitation. You can get big percentages outside of the stock market. And so that will eventually be relatively profitable. But yeah, you can, you can draw interest on all this stuff. Now, admittedly, you know, there are only like two or three of us that got them. It's going to be hard for a while to find anybody that can transfer it. But if we can get email in 10 years, how fast do you think we can get 3P gold? You send an email to everybody that you send jokes to go, hey, wow, man, this is really great. Five years? Four years, maybe? How similar is that to, to the, uh, there's another website called eGold? eGold yeah. it is similar in concept. Unfortunately, eGold is here local. They don't do any auditing. And, and it's a good idea, I don't think anybody's, but they have been raided by the IRS already. I don't think that they've, they've taken anything, but they've been hassled. 3P Gold is offshore. It is not in U.S. jurisdiction. <coughs> so what's the IRS going to do? Clip the feed to their provider. What's that? Clip the feed to their provider. Yeah, well, you know, so it's <coughs> offshore. I know the man who's helping to organize this personally. And he's either really telling the truth or I am a terrible judge of character. You know, if I had more money, I would put it in 3 big gold. I mean, I've got it can count. But, you know, it doesn't do anything right now. It's that, you know... One and only, you know, federal uh, fax machine. Well, while it's sitting there doing nothing, is it still drawing interest? I think so. I mean, I wasn't even concerned about that. I didn't even ask. But you can go to 3P Gold and check. So as this becomes more and more prevalent and more powerful, then who's going to use Federal Reserve notes? 
Why would you? You know about the kid that used to take his ball and go home? Well, it's his ball. We can all just leave the field. We don't have to use these anymore. <coughs> so the Federal Reserve may be there, but it's not going to have any authority. There's nobody playing. Bye. We leave. Thank you very much. I'll get one. You could just pay me out of boredom since you don't there have you to pay. There you go. I'd love to do that. I'd, I'd be willing to transfer money back and forth. Go out and get a 3P gold account. We'll use it instead of email. Okay. So, so, right? That eventually I'm, I'm going to be doing that. So, digital cash is something that is that is just around the corner. There's nothing that the government can do about it. This this is absolutely wonderful. When the uh, uh, the printing press came out, you know, the governments and churches in charge weren't real happy about that. Because up until then, I'm telling you what the Bible says. Oh, really? Now we can print the Bible and you can read it for yourself. You go, hey, you know, you've been pulling a fast one on me. That's not what it says. So they didn't like the printing press. What did they do? They went out and they started burning books. Were they successful? Had we eliminated books? No, because we were printing them faster than they could burn them. There's not a damn thing they can do about it. And there's not a damn thing they can do about 3P Gold. It's going to happen whether they like it or not. And the faster we make it happen, the better off we all are going to be. The Libertarian Party, page 34. Now, I really don't care who you vote for. As long as you do not vote Democratic or Republican. <laughs> Don't keep making the same mistake. Now, if you want my advice, I advise you to vote for the Libertarian Party. They have been around for 30 years. This December, we're having our 30th anniversary. They, they fight for the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to property. They are the only ones who understand rights. Your money, you spend it. You know, you're an adult, you decide what you want to do. As long as you don't hurt somebody else, you know, you can do anything you want. Gosh, where have I heard that before? The Libertarian Party is the only one that understands the Constitution. You say, well, yeah, but you can't get elected. No, not if you don't vote for me. You know, if you were the, the deciding vote, if I can, I'm going to guarantee that I can get everybody else to vote Libertarian, but I need your vote. Are you willing to vote Libertarian? I am. And, you know, even if that's not true, are you going to wait until everybody else figures it out and then you're going to be the last one to vote for Liberty? Boy, that's a patriot. <laughs> Why don't you do something brave and daring like be the first one? And then convince all your friends. Uh, page 35. There, there are three groups of people. People who don't know that there is a problem. Okay? Then there are, of the people who know that there is a problem, people think that, yes, we can solve it, and we can work within the system. If that's true, vote Libertarian. If you fall in the third group, and you think that the system is so out of hand, that it just cannot be fixed, then start from scratch. This is Texas Constitution 2000. It's, uh, it's only uh, the first couple pages of it. But Article 1 is a Declaration of Rights. Right? It says, Every, uh, all political power is inherent in the people, and all governments exist by the will of the people. The people of Texas retain the right of altering, reforming, or abolishing their government in any manner they believe proper at any time. Uh, go to page 36. I'll read two of my favorite clauses. Uh, 
Section 5, every individual has the inherent right of defending the life, liberty, or property of any other individual using whatever force is necessary through whatever means available, including the use of deadly force. Doesn't that sound a whole lot better than the Second Amendment? And just in case there's a Rosie O'Donnell out there who doesn't understand, let me clarify with Section 6. Every individual has the inherent right of owning using and carrying arms of any description. Any questions? <laughs> Article 2 is limits of the government. Government has no inherent rights or powers, neither implicit or explicit. That pretty much sums it up. And you go through, government shall never, government shall never, government shall never, government shall never, they can't own property, they can't control the free flow of ideas, government can't do anything unless it's explicitly listed. Now this is a constitution with teeth. Now the constitution has been written. It has not been ratified. How did we get this constitution ratified? Well, we had nine out of 13 states ratify it. Well, this is a Texas state constitution. We've got 254 counties. If we get 176 counties to ratify it, it becomes the law. And Texas becomes a nation. What happens to the existing statutes? They're non-existent. Okay. There, there is a transition stuff. I mean, we don't, want it, we don't expect it to happen overnight, but there is a whole program of how we're going to go from the mess that we're in now to the new government. Uh, and I give you the website for that, tcrf.com, Texas Constitution Ratification Fund. And you can read, I think it's about 22 pages. First time I read it, it made me weak. When you said it goes from a country to a nation, I'm not going to I know Bill knows a lot about it. Uh, are you talking, are, are we pulling out of the U.S.? As a nation, are you mean we would come become sovereign again like we should have been all along as part of the U.S.? No, we would be separate from... Literally. We're, you're 49, we're one. Still yes. Right. Okay. Yes. And, and Texas is not the only one doing that. The sovereign nation of Hawaii is very, very close. Alaska, Arizona, Idaho, and Montana also have very strong... Uh, uh, Just remember, the last time the, the United States tried to do this, or part of the states, we ended up a civil war over it. I understand, and, and there's a lot of debate uh, as to whether or not that would happen. I personally don't think it would go that far. But, I mean, if it did, you know, send me to the Alamo, lock and load. Got to have, have the arms in Texas anyhow. That's right. Now, now those, those are some of the things that that I think that you should know about, and I think that they should, you know, improve your outlook. Now, starting on page 39, I have a list of reference material. Obviously, we haven't covered anything as much as we would like to. Hopefully, you will start doing your own research. And I've tried to leave breadcrumbs for you to say, you know, gosh, go here, you know, just, you don't have to search through the entire library. Now, I've got a list of books, a list of videotapes, audio tapes, and websites. Now, every book, audio, and video on this list I have read, watched, or listened to. It's not just because it's got a snappy name. I've been studying the Constitution for 18 years. Now, the websites, I don't have as much. I didn't go through every single website, every single page. So there may be things on the websites that you know, I don't agree with completely, but they are all, for the most part, as far as I know, very strongly, you know, pro-liberty. Uh, and I've uh, tried to arrange the websites in the same order that we've covered topics in the class. Now, you can go to my website. Instead of typing all these things in by hand, you can go to my website <laughs> Go to the Introduction to the Constitution, which is what this class is, and I have a list of references. So you go to a page, and that same page is right there. You just point and click with the mouse. That'll save you a lot of time and effort. This website? 
Uh, no. Now that my website is listed on the, the first. 47? Uh, 44. Yeah. Forty-four. Page forty-seven. Okay, and and it shows what where where my references are. And so all of these are listed there, and you can then point and click. Now, I'd like to go through some of these books and, and tell you which ones are some of my favorites. Uh, okay, the Global Sovereign's Handbook, page 39. This book is $105 but it is worth it. Instead of going to the library and checking out you know, 15 or 30 books and getting a little bit here and a little bit there, this has basically got everything between two covers. You can't sit down and read it from cover to cover because your brain will explode. You gotta read a chapter and then just gonna sit there in a daze and absorb the information for a while. Okay? This is a very, very good book and I haven't found anything in here which... What's that? It says here is twenty five dollars. Uh, not not the Global Sovereigns handbook. Oh, okay, I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm sorry. Yeah, eight thirty nine. Okay, but you know, I basically tell you where to, to get it, and you can you can look through this uh, at the at the end. Um, the Sovereign Individual, top of page forty. That is also really good for getting your spirits up to show you all the things that are happening that the government has no control over. And instead of thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to have another civil war, you're going, wow, you know, there's actually light at the end of the tunnel. I can see how all this stuff is going to turn around and, you know, 10, 20 years from now, things are all going to be better. Okay, it's going to take a little bit of work, but we can do it. Now, The Creature from Jekyll Island is an excellent book. Okay, and it tells you how they've stolen our uh, uh, money from us, our economy. If you don't want to do it that way, go back to page 43 to videotapes. The fourth one down on page 43, The Money Masters. That for $20, you can get this video. It's three and a half hours. Now, I know that you've sat through movies that are that long. This will tell you detailed steps, all the stuff on how they stole our money. And you'll, twice, sit, twice. And you'll sit there and go, oh, man. Isn't it good? Yeah. It is an excellent. I mean, I've, I've watched it about three times. I say, sit down. You've got to see this. And we'll spend all evening learning about the money system. Uh, now, for, for most people, I don't mention it. I just kind of like to let them, because by now, they are already totally blown away. But this is a little bit more advanced group. Therefore, I highly recommend, on the bottom of page 40, Hologram of Liberty. It's written by Kenneth Royce, who uses a pen name of Boston Tea Party. And he's actually in Austin, Texas, I believe. I've been looking for him. But this book goes through the idea, the possibility that the Founding Fathers weren't trying to protect our rights, that they deliberately made Article 3 really small so that they couldn't have their strong central government, you know, in 1789, so they decided to just set it up so that eventually they would have this strong central government. And I thought that sounded a little bit bizarre until I read the book. He makes some really strong arguments for it. Page number, please. That was, that was at the bottom of page 40. Thank you. Um, okay. Lost Rights on the top of page 41 is excellent by James Bovard. Um, and he's already come out with another one, Feeling Your Pain. Those are both good. Read the Communist Manifesto. You have to know what the enemy is doing. And I also have a book here. Uh, I don't know why it's not on my list, but it's The ABCs of Socialism. It's a real thin book, but basically, you've got to figure out how they're screwing you over before you can fix the problem. Okay, that's the last of the books. Uh, the videotapes. 
The very first videotape, 1776, is excellent. It is a musical, and it seems a little bit strange to have Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson dancing, but, okay, you can get over that a little bit. And it talks about how they, all the stuff they had to go through to get the Declaration of Independence signed. When you realize how close we came to not even being the United States. It really is an excellent thing, and it's, to the best of my knowledge, it is historically accurate. I didn't see anything in there that, that I knew for a fact was false. Except for the singing and dancing. And the singing and dancing, <laughs> yes. Uh, Money Masters, uh, Waco, the Rules of Engagement. Uh, I, I have a, a video on the Ten Planks. I think you've already seen that. Now, audio tapes. We're on page 45. If you want to start learning about the Constitution, go to Barnes & Noble and get this series. It is by Knowledge Products, and it is narrated by... Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America, and um, basically it is really excellent. He, Walter Cronkite, talks about what was happening. George Washington is coming into town. They're getting ready to write the, you know, dec uh, the Constitution, and then they have actors and actresses doing the voices of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and it's really really good. I get goosebumps. It makes you feel like you're really there. And I have listened to this series wall to wall, the, the entire set, four times at least. When you're driving in the car, it's a really excellent thing to just pop in and listen to that. Another excellent series is audio archives from Reality Zone. Uh, the guy who wrote Jekyll from, uh, the creature from Jekyll Island, is responsible for all of these tapes. Um, Edward G. Edward Griffin, and they are they are on different subjects, um, and I've got those listed. One of my favorites is the uh, uh, "I Was a Spy for Joseph Stalin." I mean, this guy lived it, and when you find out all the things they were doing, man, it just sends a chill. I mean, it's even even more exciting than some of the uh, James Bond things. So, so those are all really good. Uh, and also, if you have friends that are not quite as extreme as you are, and you don't want to scare them, you know, by by giving them all this stuff right up front, I I strongly recommend How Tyranny Came to America by Joseph Sobran. You can get the audio tape for $5, which is pretty good. You can also download the text and just print it. You can have people read it. My parents think that I'm an extremist and a radical. You know, they're paranoid that I'm going to get shot. But <clears throat> I gave this to them, and they went, oh, wow, yeah. You know, we can see, you know, basically what you're talking about. So that's, that's a really good starter tape for, for any of your friends. Uh, and then the rest are websites. Uh, basically, the best that you can do is basically do your own research. Find out whatever interests you. If you're interested in the Lodial title, or you're interested in taxes, or you're interested in you know, the right to travel, there's a lot of stuff out there. And a lot of these websites point you to other websites. So the information is available if you want it. All you have to do is go out and find it. I want to remind you once again that now that you've attended the class, you're welcome to re attend any future class for no additional charge. There's a lot of information. And you know if you want to just sit through it again, uh, each one is unique. Um, I try to throw in different anecdotes, different times, and different explanations. Um, but I have enjoyed it. I, I appreciate the fact that you've all been here, and I hope that you found it very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see a show of hands. If he gets a level two, who will attend? All right, I'll take gold, silver, and <laughs> You can't ask for gold. That's illegal.